Today, I'll be providing an overall <laughs> summary on the management of tarsal metatarsal joint injuries, or Liz Frank joint injuries. Jacques Liz Frank de Sematon was a French surgeon and gynecologist. He, apart from pioneering rectal cancer resections and the lithotomy position for women, he was most famous for the Liz Frank amputation, which is an amputation of the midfoot um, that he could famously do in under a minute. I'm not sure how he did it or if his patients survived, but just slide straight off. Liz Frank joint injuries are quite rare. Uh, they account for approximately 0.2% of all fractures, and there's a, a large spectrum of injury, um, from simple sprains uh, to, of the ligaments all the way to fracture or severe fracture dislocations. They're commonly missed injuries in the emergency department, up to 20% of cases, um, which can often lead to poor outcomes. We know that there's a quite a significant risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, um, regardless of whether you operate or not, anywhere from 25 to 95% in certain studies. And there's quite a bit of contention currently about the best management in terms of open reduction internal fixation versus primary arthrodesis, which I'll talk about. The Liz Frank complex is inherently stable because of the bony um, architecture of the, the, the joints. The metatarsal, the first to third metatarsals alongside the cuneiforms and their articulations form a trapezoidal arrangement, which allows for the second metatarsal base to act as a keystone or Roman arch, which provides inherent stability. The position of the middle cuneiform allows the uh, second metatarsal base to be recessed um, closer uh, to the, behind the middle and lateral cuneiforms, so uh, approximately eight millimeters uh, proximal to the medial cuneiform and then four millimeters proximal to the lateral. And uh, this creates like a mortise uh, situation, which again in, uh, improves the stability. There are thought to be a number of uh, bony variations that could potentially predispose to this frank injuries, including a shorter second metatarsal uh, and a reduced depth of that mortise, uh, of which the, where the second, base of the second sits within. The ligamentous structures uh, of the Liz Frank complex are extremely important to understand in terms of the stability of the complex. Um, they can be described in terms of the direction that they run, so transverse, oblique, or longitudinal, uh, or the location in which they sit, so dorsal, interosseous, or plantar. Between the first and second metatarsals, there's no ligamentous attachments, but between the second to fifth, there's transverse intermetatarsal ligaments. Uh, and then the most important ones are the oblique ligaments between the medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal base, which include the relatively weak dorsal ligaments, the, the strongest uh, of, the, of, what, of which is the interosseous ligament, or also called the Liz Frank ligament, and then the plantar ligaments, which are uh, separated from the deep and superficial parts. There's also dynamic stabilizers about the joints, the tibialis anterior and the peroneus longus, and the way they attach to the uh, base of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform also stabilise the, the complex. So the neurovascular, or the, the, the most important neurovascular bundle around the Lisfranc complex is that which comprises the dorsalis pedis artery and the medial terminal branch of the deep peroneal nerve. This is important because it consistently runs under the EHB muscular tendinous junction from medial to lateral and it's uh, it's described as running lateral to the distal part of the tendon. It's also described as lateral to the EHL tendon as well. Uh, it's important to understand there's often a branch of the superficial perineal nerve that runs at the distal edge of your wound when you're doing open induction internal fixation or uh, primary arthresis that runs from lateral to medial that can be sometimes injured. To talk about the functional anatomy of the complex, it's easiest to separate the complex into different columns, so medial, middle and lateral columns, medial being the medial, uh, medial cuneiform, cuneiform and the first metatarsal articulation, the middle being the middle and lateral cuneiforms articulating the second and third metatarsal bases, and then the lateral which is uh, the shock absorber of the foot and has relative, um, a relative mobility, is that between the cuboid and the fourth and fifth metatarsal bases. Uh, just to give you an idea of stability, the middle column actually only has a 0.6 degree arc of mo motion compared to the lateral column, which is quite mobile. In terms of diagnosis of these injuries, they're commonly males in their 20s to 30s. 
Uh, the mechanism can be classed as either direct or indirect, so direct obviously being like a crush injury versus indirect being from motor vehicle accidents, fall from heights and athletic injuries. So there's a couple of different indirect uh, mechanisms that can be described, that of axial loading through a hyperplantar flexed foot, <laughs> which is in the picture on the bottom right, uh, or an abduction or torsional injury uh, with the foot anchored, which you can see in the picture of this American football player. In terms of examination, it's important to rule out compartment syndrome of the foot. And obviously these, these injuries cause significant swelling of the midfoot, dorsomedially especially. Uh, there is this a deep plantar artery that runs as a continuation of the dorsalis pedis that can be avulsed in severe injuries and can cause a large dorsal hematoma and compartment syndrome. The battle sign or the plantar arc uh, ecchymosis is commonly described with Liz Frank injuries, uh, as seen in this picture here. Uh, and often, or pretty much always, people will have pain over their tarsal metatarsal joints, um, and especially with an abduction stress movement of the forefoot and the mid, uh, the forefoot on the midfoot. Um, when stressing that, either in like pronation and um, external rotation or pronation abduction, that can also cause uh, laxity, or you can feel laxity and subluxation of those tarsal metatarsal joints. And obviously, in severe or more severe injuries, there may be inability to weight bear, um, and in the less severe injuries, it might just be painful weight bearing. In terms of uh, diagnosing a Liz Frank injury, there's a number of different Im imaging modalities that can be used. Uh, there's just five essential radiological signs that are described, so a few of them are here. So there should be a line that you can draw running alongside the medial aspect of the second metatarsal shaft and base, and that should be continuous with the medial aspect of the middle cuneiform, uh, as seen in the top left picture. There should also be a line on the oblique x-ray between the medial aspect of the fourth metatarsal and the cuboid that should be continuous. There's often seen a widening of the gap between the first and second metatarsals. You may see a flex sign, which is seen in the bottom left picture there, of a little bony avulsion of the Liz Frank ligament. Uh, the line looking at the lateral x-ray um, between the cuneiforms and the metatarsal bases should be continuous and you should notice no dorsal subluxation um, of those bones. And then the last li line is the medial column line, which is a line that's uh, a tangential line between the navicular and the medial cuneiform, which should run through the first metatarsal shaft as opposed to on the right-hand side where it's sitting outside of that. To diagnose these, these sort of signs, there's you often need a contralateral image, so an image of the other side, to compare the widening um, and stress images such as weight bearing images or even images obtained under EUA or pronation abduction of the foot uh, can also highlight these signs. These are a couple of images, weight bearing on the right and then a pronation abduction stress film on the left showing um, gapping of that first and second uh, metatarsal space and also a disruption of that line uh, alongside the medial aspect of the second metatarsal base and the middle cuneiform. There is other imaging that's available. Um, so I know Mr. Roshan Tamir and Mr. Shepard are commonly using weight-bearing CT films. This is actually a weight-bearing CT film of a patient that I saw in clinic recently that was then referred on to private for her operation. Uh, it shows that in the top right and, or the top images is her unaffected side and they're on the coronal slices the surface area of the space between the first and second metatarsal can be measured and then compared to the affected side in weight bearing and non-weight bearing. In this patient uh, they put up a little uh, sort of all the numbers as to the surface area of those two areas and it showed that on the left hand side, the affected side, it was significantly widened both in weight bearing and non weight bearing, and then it widened from non weight bearing to weight bearing as well, indicating significant laxity and ligamentous instability, which required an operation. Again, on the CT, you can see um, under space fractures that you wouldn't be able to see on X ray or may not see, as well as the flex sign again. And then MRI can be used for more subtle ligamentous injuries, especially those involving the plantar oblique ligament. Weight-bearing CTs can be reconstructed to look pretty for research as well. So the image on the left shows subluxation of the metatarsal bases and gapping of that first metatarsal space. Classification of Liz Frank injuries is done using the most commonly with the myosin classification. However, it's not a very useful 
uh, classification is it doesn't give you an idea of prognosis of the patient. No, none of the classification mechanisms have really been described as being able to give you an idea of the outcome uh, down the track. And one thing that actually Mr. Batty told me uh, is interesting or important to think about with Liz Frank injuries is to consider where the external force is coming or entering the complex and where it's exiting to try to determine exactly where the instability exists. And so that sort of guides you in your management of, as to what joints need to be uh, potentially fixed. So this is an image of a patient that I saw in the clinic as well recently that then went on to uh, have fixation, uh, reduction in terms of fixation. This is a myosin classification for Liz Frank injuries. It talks about three different types of which um, B and C is split into certain subtypes. So type A is considered total joint incongruity of the, all the metatarsal bases subluxing. Uh, type B, B1 is the medial column only and B2 is those involving the lateral raise. And then type 3 is the more severe injury where there's divergence of the medial column or the medial uh, first um, metatarsal uh, and cuneiform or the first TMT articulation along with the lateral raise going the opposite direction with either partial or total incongruity. Non-operative management of these uh, these fracture dislocations can be utilised for people of very low functional demand, uh, although it's too unwell to undergo definitive fixation. But it also should be, um, not a pretty management, should be the, the mainstay of the first sort of couple of weeks before definitive surgical management in terms of rest, ice, elevation, compression to get swelling down to allow for the tissues to be able to um, cope with the uh, definitive fixation and to be able to close the wound. Um, if the decision is made for definitive non-operative management. There should be serial examinations, plus or minus uh, further imaging, uh, and even to the point of considering an examination under anaesthetic if you're still concerned about ongoing severe ligamentous instability, um, but the previous examinations or imaging was not highlighting that. The mainstay would be non-weight bearing in a cam boot or a below knee cast for four to six weeks. It is variable through sort of the studies that I've read. Uh, and then progressing to weight bearing with the medial arch support to prevent the collapse of the longitudinal arch. Um, patients should be advised that they should expect some kind of return to function over four to six months, but there's obviously high risks of post-traumatic post osteoarthritis. Initial operative management can involve, obviously, as I spoke before, rest, ice, compression, elevation until the swelling is improved so that the, the tissues can take a definitive, or the, they can undergo definitive management. And dislocations or subluxation should be reduced to reduce the ongoing swelling so that definitive management can be undertaken in sort of anywhere from one to three weeks after the original injury. Sometimes it's not possible to maintain that reduction and as such, in this image, you can see a biplanar uh, external fixator that's holding a reduction while the, the tissues are awaiting the swelling to improve. Uh, the other option is KY fixation. Definitive operative management has a number of certain goals, so we should always be going for anatomic reduction to try to uh, mimic the previous biomechanics of the foot before it was broken, uh, and that comes alongside restoration of functional anatomy. So it's important to realise, as discussed earlier, the first, uh, the, the middle and medial columns are rigid, um, rigid constructs and very stable, so they need rigid fixation. The lateral column is very mobile as a shock absorber of the foot, so it should have flexible temporary fixation with K-wires. Otherwise, what commonly can, you can see is uh, a shortening of that lateral column and it needs to be pulled out to length, and that can often be done with a, a dorsal bridging plate, which should be removed as well. Um, one of the articles that I read also talked about balancing the loading of the foot. So some patients, if they're waiting for their swelling to come down, they can develop uh, Achilles contractures and Aquinas contractures. Those should be released to uh, afford normal loading throughout the foot um, so that there's no excessive um, forces going through the midfoot which could potentially end up with broken metal wear or increased rest rates of post-traumatic arthritis. This is a, an algorithm that I sort of came up with alongside my reading in terms of the way things should be fixed in the generic sort of Liz Frank injury. So uh, the fixation should uh, progress from proximal to distal fixation and from medial to lateral. 
Obviously, if you need to address the lateral column, you're going to need a second dorsal incision. So the, the typical dorsal medial incision should be over the, or between the first and second ray. And then the, the second incision of the lateral columns needing to be addressed should be over the fourth ray. The neurovascular bundle obviously has to be protected and is generally mobilised laterally. And obviously, if you're needing to address the third um, TMT joint, that will need to go medially to protect that. Anatomic reduction should be achieved with KYs initially, and then the decision should be made for internal fixation or primary arthrodesis. Um, it's interesting, you should always obviously consider the patient and the injury. So one of the articles talked about not considering, or it, it talked about very good outcomes for primary arthrodesis, but not, not considering it for patients, athletic patients that have had a hyperplant flexion injury, where the plantar oblique ligaments are still intact. And there's been an evolution of management from initially from KYs, which had noted that um, positions were lost, which is KYs alone. So there was a move towards transarticular screws. And now, even coming on further, there's moves towards joint sparing fixation with dorsal plating, and then even suture button constructs, such as the Arthrex mini tightrope, which means that there isn't a second procedure required for removal of metal, and there isn't prominent hardware, um, and obviously redu reduction in operations, future operations. Uh, obviously, the tightrope is not for everything, and if, if there's significant multiplanar instability, then you're going to need to talk about doing dorsal plating or uh, transarticular screws as well. There's a number of studies that have been done on uh, open reduction internal fixation versus primary arthrodesis, but actually very few on dorsal plating versus transarticular screws. There's one study that I found that uh, dorsal plating provided better short and medium term outcomes according to the AFS um, midfoot score and lower reoperation rates due to higher rate of anatomical reduction with the dorsal plating that was in 60 patients and it was prospective. The majority of the studies on oral versus primary arthrodesis uh, generally conclude that primary arthrodesis actually ends up in a better outcome in terms of uh, short and medium term pain and functional scores. Um, as well as return to previous function. Some do say that there's pretty similar outcomes, but obviously with primary arthrodesis, there's a significantly lower number of reoperations because the metalware doesn't need to be removed. <coughs> this is a, a sort of a generic, I guess you could say, post-operative management protocol for an open reduction internal fixation. This is a picture of a dorsal bridging plate that would obviously need to be removed from the lateral column. Um, so backslap for a couple of weeks and elevate, get the swelling down change to below knee cast non weight bearing four to eight weeks, uh, and then from then on progressive weight bearing in a camber with medial arch support, and then aim to return to normal shoes after three months. Physiotherapy is often important for range of motion and um, gait retraining and proprioception. And then most studies will talk about routine removal of plates or the screws at anywhere from three to eight months. That's due to the high risk of breakage if they're left in. For primary arthrodesis, uh, there's quite a, a, a longer non-weight bearing period to allow that fusion to take place. Uh, it's actually a very similar operation in terms of aura versus primary arthrodesis, but obviously the cartilage is removed for the primary arthrodesis. Uh, the fusion is generally con confirmed clinically with a stable midfoot and a maintained midfoot arch. And then from then, once, once the surgeon is happy, that generally progressive weight bearing occurs in the CAM boot. And as we said, there's no need for removal of metal. The prognosis is very guarded from this frank injuries. As I said before, anywhere from 25 to 95% incidence of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. It's how long is a piece of string? What's the risk of osteoarthritis in a, in a Lisfranc injury? It's so variable. And there have been studies looking at whether it's due to primarily an osseous injury versus a primarily ligamentous injury. And there's no real conclusion that has been gained from any of those studies. <coughs> So in summary, Liz Frank injuries are rare injuries, but they're often missed, so we need to be considering them at all times when the patients are talking about midfoot pain or if there's any, um, any question about it on the, the plane radiographs, uh, and often leads to poor outcomes if it's missed. They're very difficult to treat due to the wide spectrum of injuries, and every surgeon will probably tell you a different way of how they prefer to treat them. Uh, and then also difficult to treat because of the post-traumatic osteoarthritis. There's a still contentious or contention regarding primary arthrosis versus open reduction internal fixation. And we should always consider treating both the injury and the patient when it comes to deciding whether we not or not we fuse a midfoot primarily. Thank you very much.